Hello and welcome to Art After Hours Online. This is the first in a series of talks that will appear online. You might have noticed that you can't be in the gallery personally, but we hope that you're joining us here tonight with a glass of wine, a cup of tea, whatever beverage of choice appeals to you. This talk, we're going to be focusing on an exhibition happening here at the gallery called Under the Stars. And with me to talk through astronomy and in particular, Indigenous astronomy in Australia, we have Kirsten Banks. Welcome, Kirsten. Thanks for having me here. I'm so excited to be virtually under the stars. <laughs> virtually, exactly. Well, we get to be in this beautiful space. Um, unfortunately, our audience does not, but there will come a day when you will get to be here again. Um, we're going to be talking a lot about astronomy um, in this talk, uh, particularly given that that is what the exhibition Under the Stars is about. You are an astrophysicist. I am, yes, that big fancy word. <laughs> yes, it is big and fancy. You're, you're a Wiradjuri woman, also uh, from Wiradjuri country, which is in central New South Wales. And you're in the middle of a PhD in galactic archaeology. Yes. Which I, my, I must say does sound very sci-fi and a little bit made up. It, yes, it definitely does. It definitely does. But basically, imagine Indiana Jones in space. Okay. Kind of get I'm the trying framework. to picture that. Indiana yeah, Jones kind of get the in framework space. around. So okay. basically, like how an archaeologist would study ancient artifacts on the Earth to understand more about the history and evolution of an ancient civilization on the Earth, mm -hmm. we study the stars to understand more about the history and formation of our own Milky Way galaxy, our island universe. And do you know the origins of the universe? Can you tell us the secrets of the universe now? Or is this still something that we're still learning and finding out about? We're definitely still learning and finding out about <laughs> what's going on. Otherwise, I, was I really wouldn't have a job. I really to know the meaning of life in this talk, but maybe that might be. Might be a bit of a stretch. <laughs> might be yes, a bit of a stretch. Fair <laughs> enough. Um, before we get to the artworks, and you can probably see that there is a beautiful work of art um, behind us here, I sort of want to talk about the exhibition itself, because there's this lovely um, quote by Gulumbu Yunapingu, who is an artist, that says, we can all look at the stars, whichever sky we're looking at. And I think that's a really beautiful way of encapsulating the universe and a way of sort of encapsulating the connectedness of the universe and the oneness of the universe. Um, what do you think when you look up at the stars? I mean, I totally agree, especially in these days when we're all kind of still very much stuck at home. And when we go outside to look up at the stars, we are all sharing a piece of the same night sky, which is a great way to connect us all together. When I look up at the night sky, I feel very small mm. because it's a big universe out there. But at the same time, I also feel very large and full because I can look up at those stars and say, I know what's going on inside those stars. I know what's, what's going on with our galaxy and with our universe. And that's really cool. Mm. Like understanding those secrets of the yeah. universe. Well, there <laughs> you are know some. some secrets. There are some, I do know. <laughs> but it's, yeah, it's just this big, it's just big and it's a very overwhelming sometimes. So it's, yeah. it's, you can spend hours looking up at the stars. Well, I think the, the bigness of it almost for me serves as a bit of an antidote to this really sort of strange time that we're living in because uh, certainly I found I'm much more insular. I'm staying indoors a lot more mm. and the world has become a little bit more contracted. So to be reminded of this vast and grand universe outside, I think is, is helpful and in some ways a little bit scary because I've kind of gotten used to being so inside. Yes, we get so complacent about being in our very small little spaces, but then we realise, wait, we're not, we're not the centre of the universe. No. Like we, there are other bigger things going on out there that we can kind of get lost in, yeah. in a way, which is kind of what we want to do tonight. Yeah, a little bit, yeah. yeah. Um, talk to us about why, what drew you to astronomy? And I guess in particular, uh, Indigenous astronomy. Was there a moment where you thought, this is it, I'm into this? Definitely, there have been a few moments. So when I was in primary school, I actually wanted to be a meteorologist. Okay. So I wanted to study the, the weather and the clouds. So it's always been about the sky for me. But in high school, my science teachers, they took my entire year group out on an excursion to go see a documentary about the Hubble Space Telescope. And it's the IMAX theater one. So we were sitting there with this huge screen in front of us showing these awesome photos taken by this phenomenal telescope and that was it. I was just hooked on astronomy from there. I needed to know more about the universe. What was it about that moment that hooked you? 
it, I, honestly, I think it was just, it's just really pretty. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, no, space is really pretty. And trying to understand more about, you know, you see this huge giant molecular cloud and say, stars are born in there, but how? Yeah. And that's what I, that's what I wanted to know. Yeah. I wanted to know how and why. And what drew you to Indigenous astronomy, to wanting to look at how Indigenous Australians and various countries around Australia, how they looked at the stars and what it meant for them? What drew you to that? Well, I've always known that I'm Indigenous. Uh, my dad would always tell me that, you know, we are Aboriginal and we should be proud of that. Mm. Um, but it wasn't until I started working at Sydney Observatory in my first year of university, I started learning more about the Indigenous astronomy program that they were running there at the time that I was there. And I was learning about this huge wealth of knowledge from the uh, Gamilaroi and Yaliai people and the Borong people from northwestern Victoria. And it's just so incredible how unique and different that perspective is. Mm. Then I thought to myself, wow, what about, what about my heritage? I want to learn more about my Wiradjuri heritage and the, the stories of the sky from, from my family. And so I went out because unfortunately, a lot of our knowledge has been lost and suppressed through the unfortunate history mm. in the treating of Aboriginal people in Australia. Mm. But going out to learn more about this, I was just, it's that mind blown moment once again of seeing those giant molecular clouds imaged by Hubble to seeing the huge wealth of knowledge that lies within Australia and how unique it is. Like there are over 250 different countries of Aboriginal people in Australia and all of them have their own unique view of the night sky. Yeah. It's something that we should all really be proud of. Yeah, and I definitely want to get to that in a minute, but before we get to that, I, can't, I want to acknowledge um, this wonderful work behind us. Uh, it's called The Seven Sisters by, Arti by artist Sylvia Ken. And this has particular significance um, in Indigenous communities. So talk us through why you selected this artwork as one of the three that we're going to talk about in this talk. Why? Well, first off, how gorgeous is it's it? It's bloody gorgeous. It's just breathtaking. Yeah. And it really the, is. the detail that you see in this artwork and the stories that would come from it as well is just so intriguing to me. And because the, the Seven Sisters song line travels right across Australia. There's seven sister stories in Wiradjuri, there's seven sister stories from way across in Western Australia. It travels all across Australia and across the world too. Mm. Like we see this view where we see this, this group of stars, this it's not so much constellation, uh, it is a constellation in our sense of looking at it from an indigenous astronomy sense, but it's actually a star cluster. Mm -hmm. So these, all of these stars were born within the same cloud of gas and dust and they've been moving through space together for millions of years mm -hmm. and then this story of this man coming along to pursue these women travels across Australia and across the world this is the same story as the Pleiades from Greek mythology mm -hmm. and it's just beautiful to see how while you have these two very different cultures from across the world yeah. different sides of the world seeing these same stars sharing a piece of the same sky and having that similar perspective. Yeah. It's fascinating. And that's what sort of blew my mind a little bit about it as well, was that you had, you know, in Greek mythology, Orion chasing the Pallades. Mm. And in, you know, in indigenous communities here, you've got seven sisters fleeing from the glare of a sort of a lecherous man. Um, and as you say, it's two completely different societies, communities, times, hemispheres. Mm but they've seen this cluster of stars and they've interpreted it in very similar ways. Um, I can't help but note that women trying to escape from unwanted attention seems to be a thing that... A common theme a common that comes theme around. That yes. really has existed since the dawn of time, hasn't yes. it? Yeah, captured here. Um, what sort of significance does the Seven Sisters have for sort of everyday life? in Aboriginal communities. Is there, is there anything that is to be learned from this that people can live out in a certain way? Most certainly. Our stories that we have with the sky, the night sky for us is the canvas for our stories in a way. And there are lessons that we learn from these stories. So a lot of the lessons that come from the stories of the Seven Sisters, or at least the common theme that I've seen from the Seven Sisters stories that I've encountered, is that it talks about the law of marriage, of mm. how these people cannot be uh, married together because they're from a certain type of group that cannot be betrothed. Mm. Let's move on to our second 
artwork. Um, it's, I just glanced over there because it's, it's so beautiful. It's sitting right before us. I know <laughs> you guys will be able to see it too, albeit via a screen. Uh, it's called Malingyoi, and it's by an artist called Naminapu May Meru White. Um, tell us why you were attracted to this particular work. Well, with this one, it intrigued me because it's making that link between the stars and the land mm. because it, it's, it's painted on trees. And it's really beautiful to see that milkiness of the lighter part of the, of the trunk and then the dark parts as well because we see light and we see dark in the Milky Way galaxy. The Milky Way galaxy isn't just a big long carpet of stars. We see these dark patches in there which are the dust and gas from the dust lanes of our spiral galaxy that we live in. And it gives us this negative space, which is also very important in Aboriginal astronomy. Yeah, tell us about that. So one of my favourite constellations in my Wiradjuri heritage is that of the Dark Emu, which many people have heard of before. And it's fantastic how much more common knowledge it is these days. Mm -hmm. So in Wiradjuri, we call it Gogomen. And Gogomen, its position in the night sky indicates at which time of the year is the right time to go looking for emu eggs. So in late May, when we see a Gogomen, sitting up above the horizon, so it's just come up above the horizon as the sun goes down, it kind of looks like the emu is running along the horizon, which reflects back down on the ground that the emu are now running around on the ground looking for a mate. Mm -hmm. So no emu eggs just yet. But later in the year, after the Earth has moved a little bit further around the sun, the body of the emu moves higher up into the sky, and now in our perspective in Wiradjuri, it does change from country to country. They have that unique view. But our unique view is that we see the body of an emu, not as a body anymore, but instead as an emu egg in a nest. Right. And that reflects back down on the ground. Now's the time to go looking for emu eggs. And it is actually the outline of an emu, isn't it? That you can see um, very clearly in mm -hmm. sort of the, the Milky Way sort of forms the body of it, doesn't it? And then, there's, and then it. you can very clearly see the head. That's right, yeah, mm -hmm. and the head kind of sits just below and to the left of the Southern Cross and then continues down towards the east with a thin neck and then that big bulge, which is the centre of the Milky Way galaxy, which makes the body of Gogomen. Yeah. It's, it's incredible. Once you see it, you cannot unsee it. It's so cool. Yeah. It's funny because I think a lot of people might know the term dark emu perhaps from the Bruce Pascoe book. Mm. Um, that's become a very sort of well-known book. But this is the origins of, of where that term comes from. This is what it refers it. to. Yeah. When did you first see the Milky Way? Oh, the first time I remember seeing the Milky Way was when I was 15. My parents and I, we went for a, a road trip across the Nullarbor. We were doing the golf course across the Nullarbor. Okay. Big golf course. Big golf yeah. course. Starts in uh, Sejuna, ends in Kalgoorlie, mm -hmm. and every little town stop along weighs at least one or two holes. And we stopped at the Nullarbor townhouse, which is a servo, a pub, uh, a caravan park motel, and one golf hole. Yep. And so one, all the key things that you All need the key in things town. you yep. need mm -hmm. in a town. Um, and one street light. So we, we played our game of golf. Well, we continued our game of golf. Yep. Played our, our single hole. and. We were just sitting there and my mum had to pull me away from the window because the, when we were there, for some unknown reason, it wasn't my fault at all, mm -hmm. definitely didn't plan it, uh, but the main generator backed out and all the lights turned off. Oh, wow. So it was yeah. just completely dark. Completely dark, except for that one street wow. light. Okay. And so I was just, my parents wanted to go to sleep and I'm just sitting at the window. I was like, no, it's too pretty. I don't want to go to sleep. It's yeah. just, there's so much out there to see and so much out there to explore. And I remember I cried because it was just so overwhelming. Wow. Having never seen this before because I grew up in Sydney. Of course. You don't see that in Sydney. Yeah, you have so it's... much light. It would obscure so much of what's in the sky. That's right. All the light pollution just washes all of that out. And so seeing that truly dark sky, I'm getting emotional just thinking back yeah. about it. It's, it was just incredible to see that. It's obviously a moment that's, that's moved you quite a bit. Yeah, definitely. It definitely uh, solidified what I learned in the years before of like, this is what I need to do, this is my calling. Mm. I need to know more about space. Mm. And people have been pondering about it for, well, I suppose, for eternity, really. Mm -hmm. um, and it's funny because, in, again, in sort of that kind of Greek and Roman mythology, you have the Milky Way created by Hera, you know, essentially just like squirting her breast milk and creating this Milky Way. Mm. Um, 
And it's funny sometimes like, I find how people sort of interpret myths, like some myths we're sort of willing to accept as myths and then other myths seem really strange and out there, but they sort of all are a little bit and they sort of yeah. all are equally relatable and equally out there. That's right. They're all just a, a different perspective of the night sky. And with the Milky Way in many Indigenous groups, we see it as a waterway or a stream. So in Wiradjuri, we call it Billabong, which you may recognise sounds like Billabong. It does. That's the traditional Wiradjuri word for the Milky Way galaxy in a general sense. Ah. But a uh, the common theme we've seen throughout tonight is that what's in the sky ah. is matched and mirrored on the ground. And depending on where you are in Wiradjuri country, it goes by a specific name based on which waterway or stream you're near. Oh, because that's actually the case with, with the work that we were just talking about. Yeah. Malinuoi is actually a river in the Northern Territory, but the work also refers to it being a river of stars in the Milky Way. So there's that sort of earth-sky connection. That's it, yeah. Um, and I suppose um, in a lot of ways, Indigenous communities would have used the stars to navigate, to um, you know, uh, schedule seasons or to anticipate seasons or mm. to anticipate sort of animal patterns. Can you sort of tell us a little bit about how the stars kind of impacted in the day-to-day -day life of people on this continent? Well, the stars are so integral to our culture. It's the night sky matches what's on the ground. Mm. And we've seen that common theme. And instead of us working against something, it's the sky and the land and the people harmoniously together. So I think it's something we need to come back to and re-bring up this ideal to like come together and work with the planet, not work against it. Yeah. Yeah. So with the stars, it would tell us how to navigate to trade and trade with different countries nearby. We'd learn what, what food's around at certain times of the year, when the seasons are changing. There's a star from the Waterman people up in the Northern Territory. Uh, it's called Warren. And it's officially recognized worldwide by its traditional Waterman name. It's fantastic. It's part of the constellation of the Phoenix. Mm -hmm. And when this star is high up in the night sky, that indicates to the Waterman people that the monsoon season is about to begin. And so there's that seasonal, seasonal uh, menu here or seasonal calendar. And that's how they're able to sort of interpret or anticipate that season is by glancing up at that star. That's it. Yeah. Wow. There is truly so much that we just don't know about our own history, the history of this country mm. um, and the, the history, the way in which the land plays out with, you know, what we see in the sky every day. And I think maybe that's partly because we, we're so far removed as well. You know, we do live in cities predominantly most Australians, mm. or a majority at least, and we're sort of obscured a little bit. Or the, there's, there's disconnect there's now. There's a disconnect, yeah. Mm. Maybe everyone's just got to turn off all the lights. Can we please? <laughs> turn off all the street lights, turn off all the lights in your house. Turn them all off. Go out Let's there see and, some have stars. A, and see some stars. Um, there's this really wonderful uh, saying by the poet Muriel Rukeyser. Um, she says, the universe is made of stories, not of atoms, which I thought was really beautiful mm. because I guess it's a way of understanding the universe, isn't it? We, we, we tell ourselves these stories about it. Are there any stories that have stuck with you in your time sort of looking at the universe and up at the stars? See, the scientist in me yes. wants to say, no, but this, the universe is made of atoms. We're all made of atoms. Well, this poet <laughs> begs to differ. But so. I definitely agree with this poet as well because, you know, we, we thrive on stories. Mm. Like we learn through stories. And that's, that's the teachings of Aboriginal culture. Like, it's learning through stories from your elders and from those who are, who are more wise than you are and know more than you do. Mm. So I think it's, it's a really beautiful thing to come around and say, Yes, the universe is made of stories. There are 200, oh, you said it before, that there were 250 Indigenous um, groups or Indigenous countries in Australia that have used the stars for 65,000 years. Um, have you noticed any sort of similarities with 
the sorts of mythologies that they tell each other, or any sort of key differences, any key differences in interpretations of certain clusters or constellations? Definitely. So there are one similarity that I love is the emu. And it travels across Eastern Australia in Eora, where we are now. They have the emu too, and there's a beautiful carving in national parks near around here that have the emu carved on the ground, and the emu matches the sky emu. Mm. And then so there's a different interpretation there, but also similar that there is the emu itself. Uh, for Gamilaro people, neighbours just above Wiradjuri, their view when we see an emu egg in the nest, they see the emu sitting on the eggs. And so right, they see okay. that, that similar but unique view again. But then you go down to the Borong people of the Wagaya language group in northwestern Victoria, and the Milky Way galaxy for them is no longer a waterway or a stream, but instead it's the smoke from the campfires of the old spirits. So there's that completely different view there. And that's what I really love about Aboriginal astronomy from all the specific different groups is that it is so unique in their own ways, even though there may be some similarities. Mm. We've talked about the Seven Sisters and, and the sort of similarity um, between the mythology here among Indigenous Australians and, you know, um, the story of Orion chasing the sisters. Are there any sort of similarities or key points of differences that you've noticed similar to that spring up between Indigenous mythology and mythology around the world? Now, one thing that I really love about Orion is it comes back and links to a constellation called Bayami in Wiradjuri astronomy. Oh. So Bayami is the almighty creator spirit. And interesting enough is the exact same stars that make up Orion make up Bayami. But Bayami is not chasing any women. Oh, good. Bay Bayami, good to know. <laughs> Bayami chases the emu. And so yeah. when we see the emu up in the night sky during our Australian winters and Orion or Bayami is up during the summer. So they're constantly chasing each other right. in the sky. There's also a very funny part of this story where Bayami trips on a log and falls flat on his face on the ground, which is a bit, you know, degrading for the almighty yeah, creator it's, spirit. It's not great. But what's really cool about this story is that it's reflected in the stars. Because of our position here on the southern hemisphere of the Earth, and we are around Earth, believe it or not, yep. um, our position changes our view of the stars of Orion. So from the Northern Hemisphere, they see him standing up tall and strong. He's a big, strong uh, person yep. who you know, slays animals. But uh, from the Southern Hemisphere, he's upside down. Right. But Bayami is also upside down here, right. which is really interesting because you'd think, you know, our perspective here, while we may see the same stars as, you know, the same sort of ancestral figure, you'd think he'd be the right way up instead of upside down. Okay. But it's reflected in the story. Because when Bayami, the stars of Orion, set in the night sky from our vantage point here in Australia, he sets head first. Okay, right. And that reflects in the story, Bayami falling face first into the ground. Right, gotcha. Mm. Wow. Um, there's one more uh, artwork that I kind of want to touch on before we wrap, and I know we don't have a lot of time. Um, it's a wonderful piece called Cosmos, A Life of Fire by the artist Lindy Lee. Um, and it's, I mean, yep, you can see it there on your screen, but seeing it in person is really, it's, it's a thing in, in and of itself because it is, it is. so beautiful. It is. Um, and it sort of talks about, I guess, it's a way of kind of understanding the origins of the universe. Um, you're doing a PhD at the moment, um, sort of in the origins of the universe. A little bit, yeah. yes. You yes. know, working out where it all sort of started, going back as far as possible. So it's sort of, it's art versus science in a, in a sense, right? Mm. Or even... Or even and science art with science. That's it. It's yeah, a collaboration, not a competition. It is. I like that. <laughs> That's you got a much better way of looking at it than what I do. <laughs> yeah. Um, but does your work tell you? Well, what has your work told you about how the universe began? And, and do you see glimpses when you look at works like Lindy's? Oh, definitely. As soon as I saw this beautiful work, I thought that looks like a celestial sphere to me, like a, a little almanac of stars up in the night sky and, and what is a celestial sphere for obviously the people not me That's but a... you know anyone that might not know <laughs> what so, a celestial sphere is imagine it's it's like the circle of the sky and you have the constellations mapped out for you on this celestial sphere right well, i guess circle in this case but i'm used to saying sphere because we live in a, a spherical earth yep. and all that jazz but when i saw this it was it really caught my eye because at the same time the universe, it's like what she says in, in her uh, description is that 
you know, the universe kind of molds this. Like mm. the, the pieces that you see aren't picked by her, it's picked by the universe. So I think it's really beautiful because let's say our Earth was somewhere else in the universe and we saw a completely different night sky. It's still just our interpretation. The universe chooses this, but we mm. have this interpretation of what we see in the night sky. And it's made of bronze, isn't it? Mm. Which is sort of, a, I'm going to say it's a mineral, but I know that I've got that totally wrong <laughs> and I've embarrassed myself in this moment. But it's sort of made of the material that I guess the universe is sort of made from, isn't it? That's it. Well, in, in the very beginnings of the universe, uh, just after the Big Bang, during what we call nucleosynthesis and big other fancy science words, mm -hmm. is the first elements to be formed was hydrogen, helium, and a bit of lithium as well. Everything else that the universe is made of, bronze, copper, you and me, mm -hmm. this water, is made from stars. So the universe, we are, it's a great quote, another great quote by uh, Carl Sagan. We are a way for the universe to know itself because we are the universe. We are made from stars. That is a very beautiful quote. It's one of my favorites. And I feel like in this time, it, it's, um, you know, it, it's, it's hopeful. It's because we are so closed in and I guess we ask, we, we need to be insular even though we don't necessarily want to be. But um, I don't know, hearing you say that, I guess understanding that we are all made up of, you know, stars and this big unfathomable mass is, um, I don't know, I feel pretty hopeful about that. It's nice. And it's also being nice being told that you're a star. <laughs> but we knew that, didn't we? <laughs> I like this. I like, I like your interpretations of this. <laughs> Um, we don't have a lot of time, so I kind of, I, I do want to wrap up with, you know, a quick question. I feel like I'm here talking to an astrophysicist. I do have to ask about star signs. Oh, of course. <laughs> Everybody wants to know about star signs. I'm a Taurus. Mm -hmm. Is there something in um, Indigenous astronomy or, astro or astrology that tells a person who or what they are depending on where or when they're born? Certainly not. <laughs> but having said that, I, do, I don't mind people believing in astrology because it's a pathway to astronomy. And you didn't hear it from me, but astronomy was actually birthed from astrology. There you go. So it is interlinked. I didn't know that. It's, it's, gone, a, it's gone a little bit left field recently, but yeah. astronomy was birthed from astrology. Okay. Yeah. So if that's what you're into, then go for it. That's it. And come, come to the dark side where we'll learn about how stars <laughs> are made. It's a gateway into astronomy. <laughs> that's it. Um, well, Kirsten, thank you so much for having a chat to us um, about this exhibition. Um, thank you to everybody for watching, wherever you're watching, whether you watched it live or you're watching it a little bit later. Um, we hope you enjoyed this discussion. And we hope that you can get to the gallery in person, maintain a safe 1.5 metre distance from everyone and don't go coughing on people and you'll be right. You'll enjoy this exhibition as much as I did. Catch you soon.